Welcome to the C Word, the Conservatives podcast. Today we're talking about time-based media conservation. I'm Jenna Mathiasen, an objects conservative based in Carmarthenshire. And I'm Chloe Ramsey, an objects conservative based in Manchester. Welcome back, guys. Hello. This one's been on the spreadsheet, hasn't it? That's literally what I was going to say. It was I just know. Like, it's been there forever, staring me in the face. Six years. Oh my goodness, it was that on is a the, while. It was the original, one of the original ideas. We were like, what is that? Yes, because we were so baffled by what time-based media was. Better talk about that and then... We have actually found someone to help us talk about it though. And I think that's the really crucial bit. So yeah. we do have a special guest host with us as usual. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners? Hello, listeners. My name is Cass Fina Radden, and I am a time-based media conservator and also a huge fan of the C-word. So just like honored to be here. Well, we're also fans of your podcast. Yes, we are. Uh, which you, you are legally obligated to mention to our listeners because they should go and check it out. And there'll be a link in the show notes as well. And the name is? Art and Obsolescence. Excellent. And it's available on the Apple Podcasts, What's It, and all the places that ours is. So Where all fine podcasts are found. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's got shall we say chiller vibes oh it's so chill it's very very good listening it's just story time it's it is it's it calm is story, story time. time about art and frequently it features conservatives as well so just fyi if you're out there going oh sounds a bit arty to me no no no, don't worry <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining us Cass. it's a pleasure to have you my pleasure so it's been on the spreadsheet for so long because i was so mm. baffled when i first saw time-based media and it came with zero explanation because I think it was maybe a job advert. It was. Maybe? It was a job advert that sort of took the uh, the. I'm going to say the community. It probably wasn't. It was probably just the students that were looking for jobs at the time, or and the the, the recent graduates that were looking for jobs at the time took us all by storm because they came out and it was two posts, I believe, at the Tate. It sounds Tatey. I'm going to go Tate. It just felt like, is this a new thing that we haven't heard about? What is this? Yeah, I was like, is this clocks? Like, honestly, I don't. <laughs> and, and there was no explanation as well. It was it was sort of, I'm going to read through this. Is this exactly. It, is it audio? What is this? Exactly. And, and the job descriptions were quite obtuse. Yes. Which is, I have to say, the first, the first indication <laughs> that you shouldn't apply for the job. <laughs> Well, no, that's true. I have learned a bit more about time-based media since. Oh, yeah, but yeah, yeah. That was our first introduction to it. We need to talk to someone about this. What the heck is this? And, and yeah, and here we are. So th- maybe I do love defi- definitions, as you all know. W- what is the definition of time-based media? Oh, God. It's clocks. It's clocks. You, you nailed it. <laughs> um, nice. <laughs> So I think everyone has maybe a slightly different definition for what is time-based media. I don't know when or who first started using that term. I want to say it was probably Pip, Pip Lawrenson, uh, formerly of the Tate, now heading up the new program at UCL London, because I, I do think it was a UK thing first, before the US, because back when MoMA hired Glenn Wharton, who was the first staff time-based media conservation position in the US at a museum, they called it media conservation. So that wasn't mm-hmm. that wasn't really a thing. Um, so I'm not really sure where it originated, but it has generally become a kind of catch-all term. And I, th- I think it's become popular because the fact is that the, the discipline does encompass a whole lot of different things, you know, in the same sense that contemporary art conservation. I mean, it's like every possibly imaginable material, right? <laughs> yeah, contemporary is a big term. Huge. And I think it is maybe more a catch-all that encompasses maybe an approach or a certain sensibility that's that's required for that type of work. So time-based media is similar in the sense that it can encompass everything from performance art to software-based art to video that is as simple as, you know, something that maybe originally came on a tape and it's just single channel. It shows on a CRT monitor to things that are, you know, 16 channels and synchronized and there's interactivity. Um, so really, it's anything that involves a dimension of time. Any artwork that involves a dimension of time, sometimes that includes light-based works, sometimes it doesn't. I think there are few practitioners within the field of time-based media, broadly speaking, that do everything. You know, if you look at my colleagues Beck and Froner, who are also in private practice, you know, they specialize a lot in kinetics. They do a lot of light-based stuff, a lot of modern stuff. My kind of specialty is like, I probably wouldn't work on performance if it was only performance. Like, there's certainly people who are specializing in that who I think would be far more equipped but I have worked on performance pieces where 
there were robotics involved and there was software involved and, and, you know, things like that. So it's just a big, huge net of a catch-all term that encompasses a lot of different things. It's sort of a beautiful parallel to objects, which is also this mm. mad mishmash. It's a similar sort of like hugeness of the scope of the term that time-based media is actually, we're sort of trying to narrow it down by putting in that time should be evolved somehow. But at the same time, there's so much there that it's almost impossible to talk about, but we're going to give it a go. <laughs> I have so many questions at this point. First thing that jumped to mind is performance. Is this unrecorded performance? Um, MoMA did some incredible work uh, in kind of pioneering some practices with regards to the conservation of performance art because it really becomes, it's actually, it's really similar to time-based media conservation in the sense that um, when you are talking about something that's maybe on a videotape or something that lives on a computer, in the sense that it is about just perpetuating this thing into the future and there will be inevitable change. And that's a pill we have to swallow because it's either something goes, th the, the work goes through this inevitable change or it ceases to exist. And the way that manifests in performance is there's inevitably going to be differences physically, culturally, and how this work is performed in the future if it's totally different people who are performing it and it's been retaught by a different person. It was when MoMA first started collecting Simone Forti's performances and they were really tasked with like, yeah, how, how, do, how do we collect a performance? <laughs> and they did a lot of incredible work developing um, and I think very much in collaboration with her studio as well. Like, uh, you know, okay, this is how the institution learns this performance piece. They really focused on, you know, a kind of like muscle memory, people on staff learning the performance piece. Oh, because, wow. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think it's similar to a lot of disciplines in conservation in the sense that like, so if you come from, you know, an art school undergrad background, you as a conservator can have this like real just like sensibility with the materials. And it allows you to really talk to artists in a way that um, I think not everybody has the ability to. And so I think that's why, you know, MoMA had that approach with performance art. Of, and I'm really talking about things that like I was not involved in when I was at MoMA here. You know, it was the brilliant people and actually not even in conservation. It was in the media and perform performance art department. So it was actually coming from curatorial. So yeah, I mean, when, when we talk about the conservation of performance art, I'm not, yeah, I'm not talking about something on a videotape. I'm talking about the actual thing you see with bodies in the gallery mm -hmm. because the you know the learning of that and the communication of that and the documentation of it the understanding of all of the the incredible web of variability and things that can potentially change in the future or shouldn't change in the future you know what kind of clothes should people wear things things like that you mm, know um, mm. what are the identities of the people doing the performance yeah that that too this is already wildly fascinating to me because there's, there's something deeply human about this because it's, this is how storytelling started, you know, like mm. performances sitting by the fire, then acting them out. Uh, this is mythology. This is, this is so big and human that I sort of love the notion that a museum is trying to capture it or a collection is trying to retain it. And I think that it's similar when you're looking at other forms of time-based media conservation you know when you're talking about like a 16 channel interactive video installation from the 90s and it hasn't been touched since, since then essentially because when you do artist interviews when you sit down with the people who made it and the engineers who originally coded it there's a whole oral history to it and there's always you know I, and I think this applies to every discipline of conservation if you're talking to like people from like I don't know, the studio or like a foundry or like whatever, there's always the differential between like what they say they did and then what you've kind of realized actually happened. And, and that kind of just like messy history and past, like that's the part that I love about this job, right? It's just like the the detective work and the um, the technical art history and those like layers that exist um, that absolutely exist within time-based media in some really, really cool ways. And it makes me think of our, our episode about contemporary art and looking after yeah, sort absolutely. of more modern pieces. There was so much there about collaborating with the artists or trying to capture the artist's thoughts and intentions whilst they were still around, that there's this element of that 
in time-based media where there's really a sense that you you have to capture this. And it is oral history, you're right, that there's this sense that you, you need to capture that. But also that it might be at odds with what you're seeing because oddly, it might be that people don't remember it right because it might have been a long time ago. Mm. I mean, I barely remember what I did last week. So, I mean, I wouldn't be a very reliable person if I didn't write things down. But there's also this sort of notion of maybe people do remember, but they're embarrassed or it's a trade secret or there's something else that they can't tell you. There's an Mm. intriguing element here of detective work as well, which I love about all conservation. And you want to know the wildest, this is the craziest thing about time-based media that is, I think, really, really unique to the field. If the work doesn't turn on anymore, if it doesn't function you don't have anything to go on other than those stories, generally speaking. So that's a good point. It's really, really interesting because in some ways, time-based media is much more forgiving than other disciplines because if it's just code, if it's just a file, if it's just equipment, generally speaking, you have a lot of leeway in terms of things being undoable. (laughs) But if the object, you know, if the piece of equipment doesn't work anymore by the time you pull it out of storage 25 years later you now can't even run the piece you can't see it with your own eyes and you're completely dependent on whatever documentation existed in the past so there's a real urgency to time-based media and this applies not just to you know maybe works that are in a collection where they don't have a time-based media conservator and they haven't been dealt with it's a perpetual thing you know the the big gary hill installation that i'm working on right now i mean somebody's gonna have to redo this in like 30 years um so if it sits in storage and it well i mean actually i that's actually okay i take it back (laughs) (laughs) because during treatment that is your opportunity to create the you know excellent technologically agnostic documentation so that if it does die in storage 30 years from now, somebody does have a map. So that is different. That is different. But the pieces that haven't been dealt with by a conservator yet, or they have, but they're that kind of that level of quality of documentation wasn't created. That is really kind of the score of the piece or like the real map of the logic or like just video documentation of it running. You know, if you don't have those things, sometimes you can have very, very little to go on. It doesn't degrade slowly. It's not like a painting where it's like if the corner falls off, it's like, well, I can still see the rest of it. (laughs) It's like when something breaks, it's like, "Eh, it's kind of of gone. Wow. Yeah. So before we go any further, before we go any further, because there's loads of different things. I didn't know there were loads of different types of time-based media conservation. And we, I think we need to knuckle down into that a little bit more. But first, how did you get into it? Very accidentally and... I would imagine very different from, you know, an emerging conservator who might be interested in getting to this field today, because I I got into it at a time when there weren't training programs in the US for time-based media conservation. But that's, I mean, that's not the only reason. I didn't even really know it was a thing. And so I I trained originally as an artist, and I was just like working kind of like whatever kind of jobs. And I got this temp job working in an archive, and I really, really liked it. It was, I mean, a pretty ridiculous job. It was for the toy company Hasbro, who makes like Mr. Potato Head and Monopoly uh, and like G.I. Joe and like Transformers and like all this stuff. But anyway, so this this weird gig that like, you know, post art school me was doing just to like pay my rent (laughs) was photographing and cataloging every single toy and prototype they had ever made and it was just me sitting alone in a warehouse all day and um i think naively i was like that must be what working in an archive is like let's do this so (laughs) i i was at an opening in the city in new york and you know somebody was like what do you like what's your day job and i told them about working in the archive and they were like well that's very interesting because like you you have this interest in time-based media like that's the kind of work you make and there are these new programs now that kind of combine library science with time-based media to make like the archivists and librarians of the future. And I was like, well, that sounds cool. And I looked into the program at Pratt and figured out that I could get my MFA and my MSLIS, uh, Master's in Information Science, at the same time. So I was like, well, that's cool. (laughs) And then I'll also have a better day job because I'll have a master's degree. So I was like, this is just a brilliant plan. So I literally, you know, I enrolled thinking I wasn't doing anything other than like, you know, professionalizing to become an archivist and getting my MFA to like continue seriously pursuing my my art career, put that in giant quotes, uh, (laughs) career. Um, And 
it was literally my first semester. I found a conference proceeding called Archive 2020, and it was uh, written up by Annette Decker, you know, very famous uh, Dutch kind of like net art theorist and curator, also a uh, past guest on Art and Obsolescence, little plug there. Nice. Um, <laughs> and it was when I read this conference proceeding that I first heard of just like the concept of preserving digital art. And it was just, you know, like the the mind exploding animated GIF. I was just like, what? Like this is a th- oh. And then I was like, well, of course it's a thing. I mean, like digital art and media art obviously like are a thing. And there are people who fix paintings. So, of course, somebody's got to fix that stuff. And it just never occurred to me before. And I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And I immediately was like, that's what I want to do with the rest of my life. I didn't know how or what or <laughs> where somebody went to school for that kind of thing. And I was already in grad school. So it was kind of like too late. But then I, I found um, Rhizome at the time, uh, which is a you know small arts nonprofit. It's housed within the New Museum. And, you know, they had been writing about NetR, curating NetR for decades, you know, really, really old beloved institution in the US. They at the time had this posting for a research fellow, they were looking for somebody who was in grad school and studying library science, to help them convenient (laughs) convenient to, to help them sort out really what to do about preserving their archive of net art. Very luckily, I got the gig. And it was just the coolest thing in the world sinking my teeth into this stuff because there had been a lot of like ideas written in kind of the early aughts about what would it mean to preserve net art, but they hadn't really done anything in in the years since then. So there were all these like really exciting, like kind of almost utopian ideas about like what Rhizome could do. And then here I was like being asked to help them chart the course for what should we actually do now, like 15 years after that. And, um, wrote a paper and being at Rhizome was just a massive platform because it was just such a tiny, scrappy little organization. So like if you were there and like working really hard and like doing good work, it would just be on the homepage because they need content and like, you know, it's like cool stuff goes to the top. So that I think was actually really crucial in establishing myself as a professional because like, I didn't know anything. I was in grad school still, you know, I was like barely out of my first year. The big thing I think actually there was a preservation week, which is, you know, I like to say it's kind of like fashion week for like archive nerds. Oh, I love that. And, you know, there's just like a week of programming around the city and like talks and panels and stuff like that. And I, I went to my boss and I was like, hey, can like I like organize a thing? Can I can I like give a talk for preservation week? And she was like, uh, OK, nerd, like whatever. <laughs> like You could use the theater downstairs, like as long as it's like at three o'clock on a weekday. <laughs> and so I did. And, and, you know, and like 12 people showed up. But one of them was Glenn Wharton, the Time Beast Media Conservator at MoMA. And like, I don't know who he was. I still at this point, I still really knew nothing about the field of time based media conservation. I was very much in this like weird little corner, like looking at net art. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there was another moment like that where the, there was like a panel discussion I organized at one point and somebody came up to me afterwards and they were like, hey, you should like g- give a talk at this like conference thing. And it was AIC and it was Jeff Martin. And like, I didn't know what AIC was. I, I, I really just kind of fell backwards into this field and it was my passion and I was very very lucky I think also to be in New York because there's just such a concentration of practitioners there and institutions who in the US you know have really been leading the charge with you know really creating this field uh, and shaping it so it was really just a right place right time kind of thing uh, I think it was at that first AIC or maybe yeah I think it was at Albuquerque uh, Glenn Wharton pulled me aside and he was like, how would you like to come work at MoMA? And I was like, uh, what? <laughs> I'm still in grad school, buddy. <laughs> like, <laughs> there was no um, sensible response to that question. No sensible response to that question. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, lots of imposter syndrome. There was this kind of wild period of time where I was finishing my MFA part-time at Rhizome, part-time at MoMA. And I don't know how I did that, but I did. And, um, yeah, so it was just kind of off to the races from there. I was at MoMA for four years in the conservation department. And I mean, that was just the wildest education fathomable. And, you know, me even being at the table, I really, really credit my former boss's boss, (laughs) Jim Coddington, because Jim really had 
the philosophy that at the time I didn't really appreciate this or really fully understand it. I think he had the philosophy that, you know, we don't know shit about time-based media. So like, we're not going to go hire a paintings conservator who seems to know a little bit about this. We're going to go find people who know a lot about this and we can teach them the conservation stuff. Like, cause guess what? We're kind of a badass conservation department, like one of the best in the world. So like, we can teach you that stuff. Like we know, we need the people who like know the stuff that we don't know. That's what brought me there. My colleague, Peter Alexic also like, you know, was not a trained conservator at all, you know, went to the MIAT program at NYU. So like very, very different, like moving image archiving and preservation. I think if it hadn't been for that philosophy, I, I don't know that I would even be here right now. That's kind of how I got started. And then, um, you know, I went into private practice because after being at MoMA for four years, I think it was partially seeing how much need there was in the world because, you know, we were just getting a lot of phone calls like, hey, how do you all do this at MoMA? And I was like, I was doing a little bit of consulting on the side, like, you know, pretty much most conservators do. <laughs> um, and it just seemed like there were a lot of people that needed help. But it was also I, I started to learn that, like, I just was not cut out for the bureaucratic life. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, people who, you know, work in the same conservation department for 30 years in the same position, like, God bless them. <laughs> because, like, I, I think that there is a certain degree to which the nature mm. of this work does benefit from that. But that's just not me, which is kind of a weird thing to come to terms with, right? Like when you like luck into a job at MoMA and it's like, what? That's crazy. Um, but yeah, so uh, I, I would, you know, was doing the consulting on the side already and um, a big enough opportunity came along that I was like, okay, I'm going to throw my hat in the ring for this contract. And if I get this, it's big enough that like I can pay my rent. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, that's that's good enough for me. I can like pay my rent, you know, pay for health insurance, barely, and, you know, outsource parts of this project that I would need to outsource or, you know, bring in collaborators for and um, got the gig. And that was a project with the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. And that project was really what launched everything for me. It was mind boggling to me the difference because it was night and day, you know, once it became my full time, everything, you know, people came out of the woodwork from everywhere. And yeah, it was kind of gangbusters from day one. So very, very and, and again, I think that was a, another just like right place, right time kind of thing in the sense that that had a lot to do with the state of evolution the field was in at that point in time. Now, you know, this is like almost seven years ago. That's really cool. So, I mean, when we're, when we're talking about things going off, we'll come back to how things go off. But what is going off? Well, you mentioned light-based work earlier. What, um, so when you say light-based, do you mean light fittings and the mechanics of that? Um, when you say go off, do you mean like the computer chips and stuff? I mean, everything, you know, all, all. Entropy is <laughs> reality <laughs> of the universe, unfortunately. So yeah, whether it's um whether it's neon or fluorescence, like a Dan Flavin, or if it's a computer transistor, everything falls apart and stops working for one reason or another. You know, different kinds of physics, mm -hmm. but same thing for sure. So my brain went immediately to neon because I know there was a big big thing about that. I can't remember. I went to a talk at some point, and they were really worried about their massive collection of neon lights and how they wouldn't be able to turn them on again or repair them or that sort of thing. So they were thinking of, can we replace the neon? Can we just make the shapes in in a different type of light? Uh, what can we do to actually make the installation be true to what it's supposed to look like? Because there's no point in having a tube that doesn't light up. That's mm. not the purpose of the artwork. Yeah. And it's definitely something that came up in dynamic uh, objects, for example, if the purpose of the... yes. If the purpose of the clockwork swan is that it moves, it must move. Yeah. So we replace bits uh, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah. It's a kind of severe, great example of the fundamental challenge that you have with time-based media. It's that it will stop working and chances are there's going to be some kind of difference that you have to face. So it's like maybe that exact glass tubing or that exact gas isn't available or it's not used anymore. So we can get red, but we can't quite get the exact same right at least we know it's not the same materials so can we look at the two side by side and is that degree of change acceptable these material distinctions of like what different kinds of time-based media they are there you can't exactly draw hard 
boundaries around them because there's often a lot of overlap. So like with Neon, for example, thinking about like Bruce Nauman, like there's, you know, some pieces where there's, there's timing involved. Like there's, you know, parts that like, bzz, bzz, mm. bzz, you know, <laughs> and it makes that sound. And that um, time he's coming from somewhere. <laughs> exactly. And those timing contraptions are things that are, I mean, just amazing like the different ways that they've worked over the years you know sometimes it's like a drum and like the contacts you know cause like different circuits to complete at different times and those kinds of things tend to fail it seems uh i say it seems because like i don't work on a lot of neon but i've seen a lot of colleagues working on neon and um but the cool thing is those parts can be replaced if you have good evidence, right? And there have definitely been cases where conservators replace, you know, some crazy old contraption like that with an Arduino, which is, you know, just a little affordable, open source, programmable microcontroller that you can plug things into, you know, and also with, you know, you could say like, okay, well, there's software based art, and there's video art, but there's also like weird overlaps where it's like well it's kind of not either Mm -hmm. (laughs) right it's like it's a video installation it's an artist who's very much placed within that canon but behind the scenes there is some software or i don't know i think about like laura owens um you know laura owens very much known as a painter for the most part and you know i saw this great exhibition at uh, david geffen hall um where it's i mean it's really an exhibition of paintings that's really all that's there i don't even think that any of her kinetic kinetic pieces were there but there was a phone number on one of the paintings you know like scrawled and i was like i am <laughs> and so i texted the phone number <laughs> and all of a sudden like in a distant corner of david geffen hall i hear some sound <gasps> happening and i'm like son of a bitch (laughs) and i played around with it and it was totally this like weird like you know secretly interactive artwork that like only if you were like a weirdo (laughs) like likes to text numbers (laughs) that you see on paintings um so like i think that's another great example where like on the surface like i don't think a viewer would necessarily be like oh this is time-based media it's just a show of paintings but it has that kind of Mm. secret Mm. hidden dimension a colleague of mine, Dragan Espensheed, uh, who's the preservation director at Rhizome now, he has this great term, blurry objects, that he uses to not talk, not talk about material, um, you know, mixing necessarily, but it, he actually uses it to talk about objects where there are components and pieces of it that actually live outside of it and you can never control it, you know, like social media feeds and things like that. But I think it, I, I like that term also when just thinking about time-based media in general, it's like a pretty difficult to classify thing, which obviously is just sand in the gears of the museum institution. Because <laughs> we need to put something in our drop-down menu. <laughs> yep. Oh, that's so or in our controlled vocabulary. I thought to, to make it easier on Chloe's brain, I might read out a couple of suggestions for what time-based media can be. Yes, please. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm looking at Wikipedia. Um, (laughs) (laughs) What does Wikipedia think this is? And it's more that it includes things like it can be installations composed of Mm. video, audio, film, slides, software-based art. The term also describes works of art created for the internet, which I think is interesting. Mm. So I'm immediately thinking stuff like flash animations, um, I don't know if we can put games in this category, but I am very curious if we can. 100%. Nice. I like it. <laughs> and, you know, I'm thinking of memes and pixel art and all of the weird stuff that I grew up with, right? It all feels like it fits into this category. Video art, new media, which I do not quite know what that means. Variable media, I know even less. <laughs> Elect- electronic art, I can get behind. Moving Image art, I can get behind. Sound art, technology-based art. Expanded media, I also don't know what that means. But I feel like there's enough here (laughs) for me to get a a flavor. I can start to see what this cloud Mm. consists of. Yeah, yeah. I can start to get a sense of this. That was an amazing tour of just like all of the different, like the, that the last part things. was all of the different <laughs> academic terms. No, 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 no. These were oh. all like really well-trodden oh. academic terms that have been used historically instead of time-based media. say that anymore? So like there was, <laughs> there was, there was the whole new media era uh. and like variable media was like the Guggenheim's whole thing, like oh. John Apolito and like that whole crew and... um yeah, you know, so there have been these different uh, terms that are used in academia over time, and they 
it's it's kind of wild to think about the year or like decade that they're from because again it's like not that long ago but when you hear these terms um if you're familiar with them it's like oh my gosh i can't believe they used to call it <laughs> yeah, that. that like you know new, oh, that's sort of fun. new media in fairness you know. i feel like that a little bit about ethnographic conservation rather than oh, world culture because mm-hmm. the word ethnographic <laughs> yeah because it and and i was i started off we i mean we were in an ethnographic conservation placement we weren't were, we in yeah. our in our for our first job i feel like that was changing whilst we were there so that was 10 years ago and that change happened i guess it's the nature of language as well is that there will always be some you know drifting of terminology depending on who you're talking to and even what state of mind they're in at the time you know like there's mm-hmm. there's something very human about that there have been a couple of things that have been said and i want to delve into them a little bit yeah i also want to say Thank you for grounding the conversation with just those really practical lists of things. Because, like, I'm, like, over here, like, well, if you think about it this way. And, I can, yeah, there's probably listeners who are just like, what is it? <laughs> just, like, give me a list of materials that it includes. Thank you. So, yeah, thanks thanks for grounding that. <laughs> when we talk about this, I'm, I wrote down, hurriedly, antique time-based media. So, I suppose what I'm thinking of is old videos and stuff the materials that that is recorded on is much different to say what your tiktok videos are recorded on now how does that affect how it's cared for how does one preserve that for the future versus how you would preserve something that was filmed you know in the 80s and i know we're going very much into film but i I love this question guys i don't know what i'm talking about i'm sorry (laughs) <laughs> no, you totally do because this is this is really a great question because I think that it it gets to the core of something that's like really important just in understanding this field, and that's that you know, and I think it's something that anybody who's like a nerd or passionate about technology or like likes tinkering totally understands and has experienced in their just daily life, and that's that you know when you think back to like mid century technologies, things were arguably more open. And portable in mm. some ways, not physically mm-hmm. necessarily, you know, to record a video in the 70s, you had to yeah. lug a whole thing around <laughs> with you. Um, but portable in the sense that, you know, when you were done, there was a videotape and that videotape can sit on your shelf and the art is on That's that That's what I can tape. conceptualize emotionally. <laughs> yeah. Whereas, um, you know, now again, going back to Dragon Espen Sheed's concept of a blurry object you know you might have a piece by um an artist that's like a performance on social media that will never exist in the future in any form other than documentation even with you know like all these incredible tools like high fidelity web archiving it's still like well but that's a static capture of it and the experience of it as a user in real time on the platform Uh, that's the work right so over the course of time, and this also applies to thinking about like a video game that an artist might make or a piece of interactive software an artist might make, what that looked like in the 80s versus what it looks like today, it's much, 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 much more difficult to kind of draw a line around it and say like, this is the thing, we're going to put it in storage and we're going to pull it out in 15 years and it's going to be there. It's like, it's probably talking to the internet. It probably has like some kind of like security validation stuff. There might be sensors that aren't going to be made two years from now, let alone, you know, 20 wow. years from now. Whereas like, you know, when you go further back, it's just like technology tended to be just like bigger, <laughs> chunkier, more user serviceable. Mm. And that's just a thing that has slowly but surely disappeared from technology. Uh, I mean, especially if, if you're talking about something like VR, you know, I mean, that is software and hardware that is like very, very tightly coupled. It's like the software gets compiled and kind of packaged up for this very particular piece of hardware, which is going to be gone in like three mm-hmm. years. And sure, you could stockpile it, but what do you do when those all break? With the Cooper Hewitt actually... Um, we did this case study on uh, an app called Planetary, and it was an iOS app. And um, I think that that uh, the the writing around that project that I did uh, years ago at this point is still really, really relevant because it it really talks about how with something like iOS, like it's really out of your control. Like you have no option but to actively maintain the software. 
as though you were the company that owns the software, if you have the source code. Um, because if you don't, it just becomes this impossible to untangle spaghetti mess of obsolescence where, you know, every version, new version of iOS that comes out has its own layers of like oh, deprecation boy. and things that Apple phases mm. out. So if you wait until it's like eight iOS versions, you basically have to go back in and like untangle those one by one by one. And like no museum has the skills for that. No time-based media conservator has the skills for that. No museum has the funding mm. for that kind of work. So really the only viable method is just if you're committing to collecting something like that, you have no option but to actively maintain it every year because at least – if you do that, you might have a shot <laughs> because you can just hire probably any old developer and develop a trusting relationship with them, of course. But the things that they'll have to fix will probably be things that they're fixing on other projects that year. Whereas, again, if you wait even five, six years, it just becomes a really bespoke project very, very quickly. When, when we think about older, you know, in, in your words, antique time-based media, it's it's a lot more fun mm. to work on. <laughs> it's a lot um it's a lot more forgiving. It's very very different now when you look at contemporary work that's being made and like how possible it is to really get under the hood and understand it, which ultimately is like what defines your ability to preserve it. If you can't do that, it becomes very very difficult. I really feel like that time-based media though like creates this bridge between I guess nerds um, and and the, 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 and and the special conservation nerds that are sort of the, the I guess the the more uh, let's say stereotypical mm, conservator because mm-hmm. there there needs to be a bridge there because we, we can't all be technophobes uh, and stuff like that. Um, I know that's a stereotype, and I shouldn't keep talking. <laughs> I shouldn't keep talking about it, but. Um, and, but it's just nice that there's, that there's maybe, um, this area here where sort of like people who are a bit more tech nerdy, like I am, that there's sort of a, that there's sort of a specialism there for us to sort of look at stuff and, and have a place, which is quite nice. And all of this is making me think that my dad should have been a time based media <laughs> conservator. The, you know, the ideal time based media conservator, it's like you need to be like just nerdy enough to like be able to talk to the nerds <laughs> because you get to work with so many nerds. It's amazing. You know, it's like just every <laughs> tiny little weird, quirky technology specialization you can imagine you will encounter as a time based media conservator. And so you, you can't possibly know all of it. I always come back to this. There was, um, I I want to say it was like maybe like a GCI newsletter or something, maybe like the late aughts or something like that. And it was a conversation between like Jill Sterrett and like Matthew Gale and like somebody else and somebody else. But they were talking about the changing role of the conservator, right? And like, what does it, Ooh. what does the role of a conservator look like in contemporary art? And, you know, they were kind of talking about like the shift away from like less bench work and more like decision making and really just the kind of conceptual work and obviously both coexist but time-based media very very much falls into that kind of world where like really like at the end of the day you're focused on this big picture of the work you have to have technical expertise and like again this like material connoisseurship so that you're asking the right questions and you're not barking up the wrong tree and you have to know the right people to call. But then when it comes to that, like really like in the weeds kind of work, sometimes I'm rolling my sleeves up and doing it myself. But more often than not, I'm calling up somebody who I know who's way smarter than me. And like they are the person for X, you know, or sometimes it's like searching around the Internet and like finding some like collector of like obscure random things. And it's like, hey, like do you want to like come to this museum? <laughs> like, you know, and like, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a really interesting field because you simultaneously have to like have this like nerdy tendency. And, you know, I find actually, if you listen to like the, the interviews on art and obsolescence, it's, there's probably at least like four different time-based media conservators have been like, yes, you know, when I was a kid, I just like to take things apart. <laughs> and I was like, every time I'm like, Oh, I thought that was just me. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I, like literally when I was a kid, I had these boxes that I called my invention boxes. And it was just like, 
Oh my God, that's so Random cute. stuff I had taken apart just because I was like, I want to learn how an alarm clock works. One of the most useful jobs I ever had that I still really rely on the skills for today is um, working as a computer repair technician when I was like fresh out of art school. Nice. I can totally see it, that. It was ha- hand yeah. skills. Like I learned just like, oh, yeah. this is this is how you know if you're turning the screw too tight or, you know, this is how it's like you can force the plastic just this much, but not too much because then it breaks, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But yeah, so it's an interesting field because you really, um, yeah, you, you hold all these things in your mind, but you also are at the end of the day focused on the holistic identity of a work of art and really like how does this thing exist through time and like what conceptual or technical parts of it are important. Well, after the gentle, soothing tone so Cass, I think it's only fair that I'm reviewing something a little bit different today. In my hands, I've got a poetry pamphlet, the front of which has hand-drawn museum objects on it, which delights me. We've got a wedding cake, a pair of tweezers, I think some sort of statue in a box. There's a sofa that might be a geological specimen, an egg, and some containers, maybe a map of some sort, uh, an amphora. It's a beautiful cover. Now, I don't often read or write, because I have actually written poetry before, but I don't often read poetry, I have to say. But this one caught my eye, as you can imagine, just because of the cover. This pamphlet is called Accessioning. It's written by Charlotte Wetton, and it's a 2023 publication from the Emma Press. I'd also like to give a special shout out to the fact that it seems to have been printed by a company called The Holodeck, which as a Star Trek nerd, I absolutely appreciate. Um, I don't know Charlotte, um, but the author blurb says that she's doing a PhD in Manchester and that she lives in West Yorkshire and that she has published poetry before. Since I didn't want to stalk too hard, I don't know if Charlotte has like a massive museum background or anything like that. Uh, I don't think it matters. Uh, this is a very enjoyable read. Um, and yeah, uh, I didn't want to be too creepy. The poems in this book vary in style. Uh, some are long, others are short. Uh, some are visual in how they're laid out on the page. Some are absolutely hypnotic. Uh, others are easy to digest, like little snacks. And others I feel like I'm still chewing on. Uh, what I'm saying is there's a lot of variety. Charlotte plays with style a lot, and I particularly uh, appreciate the way that she plays with language. Uh, she uses a mix of what I'd think of as quite jargony words that are quite, or maybe sentence structures that are quite academic in nature, or that um, have that museum text label feel to them, which is a beautiful contrast to the really human bits of poetry in between. Uh, not that text labels can't be poetry, of course they can be, but the contrast is something that I really enjoy. I think based on the title, I expected more of a pure museum flavour, but it's actually got a bit of everything. There's like a dash of archivist, uh, there's even some cartography, a uh, bit of artist, um, Many of the poems spoke to me of what we do and of imposter syndrome and our worrying about the stuff that we arguably worry too much about. I think the most conservator poem in the whole pamphlet is one called Private Tour. And it's so short that I just can't bring myself to read it uh, out to you right now because that would ruin it. So instead, I encourage you to go and read it yourself if you can. But what I think I can get away with is reading part of a poem because I haven't asked Charlotte's permission to do this and you know obviously we don't want to ruin the book um so I think what I will do is I will read part of a poem just to give you a bit of a flavor I've done a lot of shock and horror underlining in this book already um with pencil I'm not a monster to remind myself of which bits I actually really loved or which ones moved me the most so it is a little bit difficult to pick but I'm gonna go with I will read you part of a poem called Exhibit A24123331 Sloth Skeleton, uh, apparently Manchester Museum. Gently they lift and loop his elegant hooked toes to his perspex cross. Swung supine, small as a child. He is fretwork, unfleshed, an armful of air, snappable. Stripped to articulate mechanics, Jointings and engines, 
load-bearing carabiner claws. Exacting requirements gleam warm white. That one gets a bonus point for mentioning conservation elsewhere in the poem. Anyway, if you enjoy this sort of thing, by which I mean poetry, uh, and possibly museum adjacent, uh, then I would definitely recommend giving this one a go. This pamphlet has 30 pages, uh, containing 16 poems, and costs £7 from the Emma Press. Links in the show notes as usual. Hey guys, Jenny here. Yeah, it's still me. Um, yeah, just in case you guys like what we're doing here, uh, one way of supporting us is to join us on Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash the C word, you can join us for as little as $1 per month. And that goes directly to supporting the podcast, keeping it online, um, helping us stay sane while we make it because we don't get paid for any of this. Yeah. If you like what we do, please consider doing that. Uh, If Patreon isn't your thing because it is a recurring subscription model, then you can, for example, donate to us via PayPal on our homepage, uh, theseaward.show. If you go on there, then there's a button you can can click and you can just donate to us. Um, No strings attached. Um, Thanks very much for considering supporting us. Uh, We do value it ever so much. Thanks for listening. We're the C-Word, and you'll be listening to Cass Fina Radden, Chloe Romsey, and me, Jenny Mathiason. Join us next time for an episode about paintings conservation. In the meantime, you can check out our website at theseaword.show, tweet us at the C-Word Podcast, find us on the Fediverse at the C-Word Podcast at Glamorous, or simply email us on theseawordpodcast at gmail.com. The intro and outro music is Spring by Didi Music, used under a Creative Commons attribution license. Additional music and sound effects by Callum Robertson. This has been a Wooden Dice production.